Before we dive into this video, there's one thing I feel I have to say. It could be argued that the majority of games are best enjoyed blind, with the player having as little information as possible about the experience they're going into. Games, after all, are about discovery, exploration and wonder, and whilst there are a few exceptions to this rule, Rainworld is not one of them. This isn't due to Rainworld's tightly written and gripping narrative, the game's lore is fed in such small morsels that most people will still be piecing together many of the more intricate and nuanced revelations long after the credits roll. But where the narrative of the game lacks detail, the world building, locations, game mechanics and the incredibly dynamic biosphere contained within are so masterfully crafted and unique that you would be doing yourself a disservice by not experiencing it for yourself first hand. Watching this video will ruin what I would consider to be Rainworld's strongest asset. The experience of discovery, of learning to survive in a world that doesn't care whether you live or die. The transformation of struggling to thriving, from timid and meek to courageous. It's a journey that is best experienced directly, alongside the small, fragile slug cat who acts as your eyes and ears into this strange alien world. Consider yourself warned. Rainworld is the creation of indie game studio Video Co. And as of writing this, it is the first and only commercial title released by the studio. Which is an astounding thing to say. Rainworld presents itself with a confidence that makes it hard to believe it's the debut title of two sole developers, Jor Jakobsen and James Therrien. It's rare for the first game of any studio to know exactly what it wants to be. Even rarer that it should accomplish its vision with the deafness and unfaltering conviction that Rainworld does. But for such a game to be the product of a tiny studio, and for it to be that studio's debut title is almost unheard of. Video Cult have justified their name in creating not only a cult classic, but one of the best games I've ever played. Rainworld is a hard game to describe. On its face it could be mistaken as another 2D pixel art platformer, albeit one with a beautifully distinctive visual style. But to do so would be doing it a grave disservice. Throughout the game, you play as a slug cat. Which honestly gets close enough in describing the creature you will witness being stabbed, blown up, but mostly eaten. Eaten by something bigger and scarier, eaten by plants, eaten by leviathans. If there's one thing all life in Rainworld has in common, it is their apparent, insatiable hunger. There are two things I want to mention regarding the previously stated lack of narrative I spoke of. The first is that this is not a criticism of the game. Much like in FromSoft games, Rainworld gives the player all the pieces to put the puzzle together and the resulting completed picture is a satisfying and strangely lingering ordeal that incorporates some truly unexpected subject matter. Second is that again, much like FromSoft games, a lot of Rainworld's story is told through environmental design and the creatures that inhabit it, where a piece of information regarding the state of the world or the events that have come to pass may not be explicitly stated it can almost always be inferred by those paying attention. None of this is to say that there is no narrative at play. Rainworld has a traditional three-act structure to its story in a lot of ways that incorporates all of the main beats of the traditional hero's journey, and it does so surprisingly well. The game embraces this to such an extent that towards its conclusion, the narrative reaches towards an almost literal revelation for Slugcat. I could be tempted to call Rainworld's story one that is fundamentally religious in nature, but at the very least, I expect few would disagree if I referred to it as spiritually inspired. Aside from the obvious connection to the idea of karma, an idea that draws strict parallels to Buddhism and Hinduism, Rainworld leverages themes around enlightenment and an eternal cycle of rebirth that must be transcended. The idea of enlightenment, or transcendence as it's called in Rainworld, is what drives the plot forward, but it can remain out of sight for much of the journey if one isn't paying close enough attention. Not until the game's final moments is there the almost undeniable reality of what you're confronting. And I say almost undeniable, because as is true with most good stories, the game leaves open the possibility that not everything is what it appears to be, instead leaving the player with the ultimate responsibility of deciding for themselves. It's important to set up the framework of the story, and the following events all take place long before the start of the game. In fact, much of the information describing these events is locked away behind collectible items that many players will miss. Which is a shame, because while the lore of Rainworld would make for a short book, what is there help so much in elevating the game's narrative that I can't help but feel it would have been better served up front and directly instead of tucked away off the beaten path? 
long before the time of the slug cat, an ancient civilization existed that was obsessed with escaping the great cycle of achieving a true death. In their efforts, they dug deep into the depths of the world. Too deep. Far underground and hidden away from prying eyes, they discovered a great sea of void, creatively named the, the Void Sea. Good, good job there. Trial and error ensued until they were able to isolate and extract a substance known as Void Fluid, which they were convinced was the solution to achieving transcendence. Beings of this civilization took to diving into the Void Sea, hoping to be erased from material reality and thus break the cycle of reincarnation. But it was discovered that too large an ego, or those carrying too heavy a karmic debt, would instead undergo a semi-transcendence and end up as abominations. It's a detail that highlights and drives home the dangers of unearned wisdom, a powerful message that you will come across if you spend any time seriously invested in meditation, psychedelics, or any other similar spiritual practices. There are some things that the mind cannot comprehend without breaking. Lovecraft was a big fan of this idea, and so much as in Buddhism, in Rain World, without the proper mental cleansing, without the dissolution of ego, one will not be granted the key to break the chains of servitude and exit permanently the cycle of existence. So driven to escape the cycle, this ancient civilization constructed entities known as iterators, super-intelligent sentient AIs designed with the sole purpose of solving the great problem. Unfortunately, their society collapsed before the great problem could be solved, and they disappeared, leaving behind the iterators who continued the work of their creators, seeking for a way to achieve true death something they themselves would be forever denied due to the strict protocols written into their programming forbidding any form of self-destruction. It is long after the disappearance of this ancient race that you are introduced to the world. What has become of the iterators? Did they ever find the answer? And just why is the game called Rain World? You see, where Rain World's overarching narrative is anything but heavy-handed, the snippets of lore that are dished out piece by piece coalesce into a deep, fully realised history-rich world that I was not expecting, one that was a real joy to uncover. The game doesn't present you the story, it lets its world do the talking, occasionally filling in the details with various items and the very rare occasion of dialogue. And we will return to that story a little later in the video to dig into the themes and ideas that Video Cult are exploring, and it's difficult to say if Rainworld is a hopeful tale or a bleak reminder of the fallibility and fragility of the conscious mind. There is a bittersweetness that saturates this world, a melancholic undertone that persists long after the credits roll. But it is memorable, which in my book is high praise for an industry that is so terrified of taking risks. Once again, the indie scene shows what can be done when developers are free from the shackles of corporate overlords. Speaking of memorable, In few places does Rainworld shine brighter than in its gameplay. On starting a new game, you will be presented with a beautifully drawn cinematic showing a family of slug cats heading out to hunt for food. They succeed and are seen chowing down on some deliciously chewy bat flies, but it's a victory that is short lived. A single drop of rain is seen falling upon one of the slug cat children, and in Rainworld, rain is never good news. The family attempts to make it back to safety, but as the storm grows in intensity, one of the younger slug cats loses its footing while crossing over a ravine and falls into the water below. Finally, we see the slug cat alone looking out over the horizon. This is the setup for the events that come to follow, but not necessarily. You see, Rainworld has three difficulty options, which are denoted by the type of slug cat you choose to start the game with. The white slug cat, known as the survivor, this is who we see in the opening cinematic, but then there is also the yellow slug cat, known as the monk, which serves as the game's self-proclaimed easy mode, and the red slug cat known as the hunter, acting as the game's hard mode. Unlike so many other games, these difficulties don't just change around arbitrary damage modifiers and enemy health values, instead they fundamentally impact the way in which the player can interact with the world. Rainworld, in essence, is a game where the player must collect enough food 
and return to a shelter before the next rainstorm in order to increase their karma. Throughout the world there are gates which allow access to neighbouring locations and these gates will either open to you or remain shut, depending on your current karma level. A successful hibernation increases your karma and death decreases it. Simple stuff. The monk requires the least amount of food to successfully hibernate, meaning it can technically be easier as less time spent foraging for food is more time spent progressing and finding shelter from the rain. Not only this, but once the monk unlocks a karma gate, it remains open even if the player drops back down below the required level, meaning you'll never find yourself unable to traverse back to less hostile parts of the game world. The world is also filled with less numerous and less dangerous enemies, there are additional shelters available and more resources spawn around the map. However, there are also some downsides. Due to the passive nature of the monk, they deal far less damage with spears, one of the few offensive weapons available to the player, and they have a lower maximum food count, so less food can be carried forward into future cycles, meaning you can't stock up on as many resources to prepare for a long journey. But the biggest drawback of the monk is its inability to collect perils. Coloured perils, that is. You see, perils in Rainworld act as sort of collectible data pads and are the biggest source of acquiring lore about the world and the events that have happened. I think this could have been handled differently. Whilst it's certainly great to offer an incentive to try higher difficulties, locking the majority of the lore behind difficulty settings seems an odd choice. I will note that playing as Survivor, the game's default difficulty, there, there isn't a huge step up in terms of challenge, and the game does offer an in-universe explanation for the lack of perils in the monk's timeline, but for those that wanted an easier time with it, with the option to dig into the lore, I'm afraid outside of mods or looking up the wiki, you're, you're out of luck. I think a better solution would have been to have unique lore available for each of the three difficulties to give the player a reason to explore off the beaten path in subsequent playthroughs. I mentioned the monk's timeline. That's because the journey of each of these three slugcats takes place across different time periods, with the hunter being the first, followed by the survivor, and then finally the monk. This means that as the monk, you're following in the footsteps of those that came before you, and whilst these changes are fairly subtle in nature, it can be interesting to witness how events have progressed with the passage of time. This is the reason perils are absent from the monk's world. The passage of time has led to the data they contain becoming corrupted. This slugcat specific timeline also leads to some slight differences in how others will respond to you. At the opposite end of the spectrum we have the hunter, taking place first in the timeline and only unlockable by completing the game with either of the other slugcats or by depositing a certain text file into a certain game folder. The most striking difference when you begin a hunter run is where you start the game. You are far away from the relative peaceful outskirts the other two slugcats begin. The second most important difference is the limited cycles you have to reach the end of the game. It starts at 19 and when you eventually reach zero you will start to suffer from weakness and exhaustion and if you die whilst your cycle is at or below zero then it is game over. The hunter's world is filled with more challenging and extra aggressive enemies, but to compensate he can carry two spears at a time and they deal extra damage to enemies. Another big change up for the hunter is his ability to eat other forms of life, where the monk and the survivor are relegated to feasting on fruits and grubs, as the hunter if you can kill it, you can eat it. So on one hand it allows for the larger quantities of food required to hibernate to be gathered quicker, but it comes with the risk of having to put yourself directly in harm's way to do so. In direct opposition to the prey mentality of both the monk and the survivor, you will instead be actively seeking out enemies as a means to feed yourself. This playstyle is further encouraged, as although you can still consume fruits and bugs, they only replenish a food pit by one quarter instead of the typical full pit found in other difficulties. There are a number of other smaller changes to go along with what's already been mentioned, including less shelters, a faster movement speed, and adjustments to item spawns to mention a few, and I have to say that combined all together it makes playing through the game as the hunter a vastly different experience that is unique enough to keep the game feeling fresh. Make no mistake, finishing the game on hard can be an incredibly difficult feat to accomplish. Especially for newer players, Rainworld's design gives rise to a highly, and I mean highly, unpredictable world where death can and unfortunately will happen at times, with you the player having no means of avoiding it. This brings me to my first real complaint of the game. The world takes place across 12 expansive zones, with each zone broken up into multiple screens. Every screen has various entranceways and exitways, which allow for an incredible amount of interconnectivity. However, each of these individual screens can vary in size, 
with some only filling a single window and others requiring multiple shifts of the camera to traverse. Rainworld's camera does not follow the player. Outside of a tiny movement to alert you of an approaching camera breakpoint, meaning that a precariously placed enemy can be sitting just out of sight with no way for the player to know. The game handles the actual screen to screen transitions better with flashing coloured lights at each exit point to alert you when an enemy is either using said exit way or very close to it, which can alleviate some cheap deaths. But when it comes to moving around within a larger singular screen, expect to be chomped upon unawares on more than one occasion. It's an issue that can cause a lot of the frustration during a hard mode run. There are ways to lessen the chances of such unwarranted deaths, but they do happen and it never feels great when they do. So what is it that you actually do in Rain World outside of finding food and hibernating? Well, mostly you get lost. You can bring up a world map at any time. It starts hidden and is slowly revealed as the player traverses across each location. So there's no way to know exactly how to get to a particular zone or where the nearest shelter is without exploring. This works well with Rainworld's main gameplay loop. You are constantly forced into the unknown, required to find food, find shelter and make progress before the next bout of rain. But due to a fairly intricate level design, the map system isn't perfect. Areas can overlap one another, creating a situation where adjoining locations become obscured. Looking at the world map in its entirety, say on the wiki, it looks flat. But this is the result of trying to show all the game's location on a two-dimensional plane. In reality, the world actually expands out in three dimensions. So whilst the immediate moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is restricted within two axes of freedom, when travelling from area to area you can move up, down, left and right, but you can also move front to back. This lack of readability only becomes more prominent as more of the world map is revealed. There is perhaps an unintended benefit from this however, as I found myself learning to navigate by becoming familiar with each area more intimately. And in some ways, the downside of the system makes sense. What you see when you open the world map feels almost like a reflection of the internal image of the world Slugcat has in his head. It can be messy and hard to decipher, but it's good enough most of the time to point you in the right direction. It's an example of Rainworld's lack of handholding, and there are many such examples. At the very start of the game, you will notice a small yellow creature following you. This is an overseer, who is helpful enough to provide you with the basic controls, and then proceeds to make it his mission to confuse you as much as he possibly can. It took me much longer than I'd care to admit to figure out that it was trying to point me in a direction and wasn't in fact taunting me every time my limp, lifeless body was dragged away to be devoured by some overly aggressive neon disco lizard. You see, the overseer does point you in the right direction, but he also points you towards food and shelter, both of which can be back in the direction you just came from. Symbols appear above his head to help clarify what he's alerting you to, but the game never explains what these symbols mean and some of them are far more cryptic than others. And as is customary with such relationships, your little one-eyed friend can lead you blindly into trouble without any real concern of his own. Rainworld's end goal is actually fairly simple. You need to accumulate enough karma in order to open the way leading to the Void Sea. But it can be a long time before the game makes you aware of this goal. Many, many hours in fact. Which can lead to a feeling of uncertainty. This isn't a small game, my first playthrough took me over 28 hours, and if I had to guess, the first 8 of those hours were spent lost and bewildered, where I never really knew if I was making progress or not. It can at times, especially in those early hours, become dangerously close to feeling impenetrable. It's no surprise that almost all of the game's more negative reviews focus on this one aspect. The gaming industry at large has, over time, placed a higher emphasis on accessibility. Less and less is the player expected to have to learn through trial and error. Why have failure be paramount to success when you can give the player all the information they need to avoid failure entirely? It's a question I think that has an obvious answer but it's one largely discarded by the allure of reaching a wider audience. A notorious difficulty can turn away potential players, but it can also have the opposite effect. Games that are too easy are hard to stay invested in. If the challenges presented don't demand your full attention, then it's inevitable that your attention will find something else to focus on. On the other hand, games that are too hard can have a similar effect. If a challenge seems too difficult to overcome, it becomes hard to convince yourself it's worth wasting the time to throw yourself at the same brick wall over and over. It's a delicate balancing act that most games don't even try to succeed at. 
It's the reason we have difficulty settings. And it's a rare group of developers that are able to create a fair and balanced experience without relying on them. But, as already mentioned, Rainworld does have difficulty settings, and I think it was a smart move. Playing as a survivor presents a level of difficulty that feels closer to the hard settings on most other games, but even as the monk the game is not easy. There's an inherent level of difficulty that arises from a number of the game's mechanics that are present regardless of the slug cat you start the game with. Rain is always deadly, creatures can always one-shot you, food is always required to hibernate, and karma gates retain their initial karma requirement even for the monk, meaning that although they will remain open after you've unlocked them, you're still required to prove you can succeed in each location before being allowed to move on. And in many ways, Rainworld's difficulty settings skew closer to feeling like class choices in other games. When playing as the monk, you sacrifice damage and lore in exchange for minor quality of life changes. The hunter is faster and stronger, but is beset by enemies more often. There is enough done to temper the punishment doled out on the player without losing the essence of the experience that is so engaging. And Rainworld demands the player's attention and willingness to experiment and learn in order to progress. It is quite possible to end up right next to the end zone of the game only to be met with an impassable gate not long after starting your playthrough. This can be frustrating, especially for new players, as they are now left with two options. Either traverse all the way back, which in some cases can feel impossible if you happen to luck your way past some of the tougher enemies, or start the game over from the beginning. On my first playthrough I ended up softlocking myself in a zone known as the drainage system with no idea of how I got there, or how to get back to the previous area, and whilst I guess it wasn't truly a softlock. If I found myself in that situation now, I could manage my way out without much trouble, but it was a softlock at the time as I didn't have the game knowledge to progress out of the corner I'd found myself stuck in. Whether or not you enjoy that kind of player responsibility, and it's something I've come to appreciate in games as I've got older, it's not a great first impression for new players, and I can see many people ending up in a similar situation and abandoning the game, which would be a great shame, because once Rainworld clicks, it becomes something unlike any gaming experience out there. Before moving on, it would be remiss of me not to mention the game's soundtrack. The game's opening cinematic is accompanied by an excellent arrangement of heavily modulated plinky percussions that sit behind a wailing synth, weaving between major and minor keys as slow distorted chords move the piece forward. It does a great job at encapsulating the game's atmosphere. It's both sombre yet hopeful, like catching glimpses of the sun behind darkened clouds. The moments of light may be fleeting, but they act as a reminder to hold on for brighter days. The rest of the soundtrack is equally as impressive. It's an admirable feat for a musical score as adventurous as Rainworld's to retain its sense of identity despite the unconventional paths it frequently ventures down. There are tracks here that wouldn't feel out of place if you heard them playing in one of Mass Effect's many bars, tracks that could slide into an M83 album without raised eyebrows. From driving synthwave to unsettling discordant ambient pieces, the soundtrack does such a fitting job at complementing the game's visual style that the two elements feel almost inseparable. If everything you've heard so far has piqued your interest, then I strongly suggest you stop watching now. You've already heard too much. And, if I had one piece of advice for you before you set out on your own journey, it would be this. Keep heading east. Taking another look at Rainworld's map, it can be easy to think you have a Metroidvania on your hands, and yet at no time throughout your playthrough will you have acquired any new abilities. Slugcat can jump, slide, crawl, swim, pounce, hang from ledges, wall jump, backflip, and balance on poles. The movement system is flexible enough to allow for slide boosting, slide pouncing, slide flips, throw boosting, pole hopping, and much more. It's one of the joys of becoming familiar with the game's controls. What starts off as a somewhat awkward feeling control scheme with some clunky movement values soon evolves into a seriously malleable movement kit that will have you back flipping over enemies and swinging from the ceiling just like Spider Cat. Wait, man. Wait, no, Slug. Spider Slug. Slug Man. Slug Man. I would play Slugman. You can also pick up and throw various objects including food, stones, rubbish, spears and explosive spears, grenades, cherry bombs, flashbangs and much more. Many of these items have additional uses outside of their direct application. For example, spears can be thrown at enemies to inflict damage, but they can also be lodged into walls to allow you to traverse to previously inaccessible shortcuts. 
Spore puffs, an item that will send out a strong scent capable of attracting large reindeers, which Slugcat uses to ride across sweeping plains of otherwise lethal living grass, can also be used to pacify bees, allowing you to collect beehives which in turn can be used against predators in either a defensive or offensive manner. It's these systems of interplay between objects, the environment, and the ecosystem that make discovering something new feel impactful. Some may find Rainworld's lack of direction, its lack of information aggravating, but it makes moments of discovery all the more memorable. If I look at all the games I've enjoyed the most, they all have one thing in common, player agency. Games that tell you where to go, how to complete your quest, map markers, item descriptions, breadcrumb trails, these are all things that detract from player agency. If a player knows a zone contains enemies 20 levels higher than them, where they don't stand a chance, well, they're not going to go there, at least not until they're closer to that level. How many people died repeatedly to the skeletons outside of Firelink Shrine before they realised there was another way to go? That feeling of finally progressing through Undead Burg is heightened by the time spent dying over and over to skeletons. In the same way, if the first time I picked up a spore puff in Rainworld, there was an item description that told me, hey, you can use this to attract reindeers, and also, hey, you can use this to pacify bees, then that moment of discovery, that moment of joy, it would have been stolen from me. And I don't like when joyous things are stolen from me. You also have the ability to swallow many of the items you find, giving you the option to regurgitate them at a later point when they're needed. You can only have one item in your stomach at a time, and certain items like spears can't be swallowed, but it's a nice added feature that allows for a degree of forward planning especially if you're headed back into a zone you know said item would be useful. As mentioned previously, there are 12 zones in Rainworld. The outskirts, the industrial complex, the drainage system, the chimney canopy, the garbage wastes, the shaded citadel, shoreline, sky islands, the farm arrays, the exterior, by pebbles and the subterranean. Many of these zones are broken into smaller subzones, and there's a massive amount of freedom afforded when it comes to navigating around. Each zone has a specific biome that is home to different creatures and environmental hazards. There is some overlap between zones, for instance, lizards can be found in most but not all zones, however, there are some creatures that are unique to a small number of locations. If, unlike me, you are successful in decrypting the Overseer's somewhat sporadic directions, you'll be led east and up from the outskirts, towards the industrial complex. There is, however, nothing stopping you from heading west towards the farm arrays or down towards the drainage systems, as both these zones are connected to the outskirts, with the only real restriction in place being that of a slightly higher karma level being required to unlock each zone's corresponding gate. It's one of those weird dichotomies that Rainworld offers up. There is the natural impulse to explore, but with it the absolute possibility of getting stuck somewhere you're unable to retreat from. This is especially true for someone just starting out. It's not particularly hard to successfully hibernate the required number of times to access the farmer race to the west, because the starting zone of the outskirts is fairly tame by Rainworld standards. But the developers do seem to have anticipated this, and even though you need a karma level of 5 to enter the farmer race from outskirts, the return journey only requires level 2, meaning if you've died enough times in the farmer race to drop your karma level all the way back down to 1, you would only need to successfully hibernate once to return, but depending on how far you've progressed into the zone and where your last hibernation spot was, this could be harder than it sounds. The journey across Rainworld's world is many things. It can be exhilarating, exhausting, awe-inspiring, and it is almost always tense. A big reason for this is the game's health system, or more accurately, the lack of one. In Rainworld, you are either dead or alive. There is no real damage system, at least not for you as the player. Enemies can be injured and will change their behaviour accordingly, but we'll get to enemies later. If you dig into the game's code, then technically Slugcat does have a health value, but I can't think of a situation when it comes into play. On occasion, when you are grabbed by certain enemies, there's a chance you won't be killed outright. You can discern this by looking at your eyes. If they appear as crosses, then you are truly dead. Otherwise, there is a chance another creature could intervene, either to try and steal you away, or by eating the thing that's currently eating you. The lack of a health bar has led many people to suggest that Rainworld is ferociously difficult. Mixed with the unpredictable nature of the enemy AI, the constant changing enemy placement, 
and the ever-looming threat of rain, the game does little to offer the player moments of respite. Most successful hibernations, especially those occurring as you push into new zones for the first time, will be accompanied by an audible sigh of relief. And like enemy behaviour, the rain itself is not constant. There is no set allotment of time after each hibernation to find enough food and push forward to the next shelter. Instead, the rain is on a randomised timer, giving you roughly anywhere from 6 to 13 minutes to find your next meal. This can mean that during a shorter cycle it may be necessary to find food and return to the shelter you set off from that day, waiting instead for a longer dry spell to venture out into the unknown. There is the possibility to shelter from rain without a full belly of food, you can instead choose to starve yourself, forcing a hibernation so long as you have one full pip of food. This acts as an all or nothing gamble the player can take in a last ditch effort to retain their precious karma. After starving yourself, the game will not save and in order to successfully hibernate again, you will require a full food bar. This means a total of 5 full pips for the monk instead of the usual 3, 7 versus the usual 4 for survivor and 9 for the hunter who normally requires only 6. Additionally, you will become exhausted if you exert yourself too much, slowing your movement and decreasing your ability to jump. This is accompanied by a nice visual touch where Slugcat is visibly desaturated and skinnier in stature. In all honesty, I never found myself using this feature all that often. Death in Rain World usually comes quick and unexpected, leaving little time for the slow degradation of starvation. Because successful hibernations act as the game's checkpoint system, and the fact that you need enough food in order to successfully hibernate, you will be spending a lot of your time foraging and hunting for your next meal. The food you eat is only used up when you use a shelter and won't deplete during active gameplay, which goes a long way in stopping it from feeling like a cheaply tacked on survival mechanic. Rain and food go hand in hand. From the rain you must shelter, and in order to shelter properly you require food. It's these two systems working together that provides much of the impetus in driving the player along, never allowing them to linger for too long in one place. Fruits that are picked can take many cycles to regrow, insects and bat flies need time to repopulate. It is inevitable then that over time you will be driven further afield in search of new pastures. It should be noted that if you stumble across a large food source, it is entirely possible to bring it back to a shelter and store it for the future. However, Slugcat is not alone in this world and there is no guarantee the opportunistic hands of others won't decide to profit from your hard work. When you've filled your belly and the sky darkens, it's time to seek shelter and the effects of the rain are dependent on where you are in the world. Out in the open, direct contact with the rain leads to a quick death, whereas enclosed spaces fill with water, effectively drowning you if you're unable to make it to a shelter in time. However, the game does give you plenty of warning, with a variety of visual effects increasing in intensity as the rain approaches, and even going so far as to give you a visual indicator at the bottom left of the screen where you can track how far away the next rains are. There are a couple of very specific places in the game that are unaffected by the rain, but for the most part it will be a constant threat that nips at your heels, reminding you not to squander what little time you have. To be clear, there are no time limits in Rain World. No part of the game world will be closed off if some hidden timer isn't met. You can spend as much time as you'd like in any zone, mapping out the best routes, shortcuts and resource spawns, and this is often a good idea. It's easy to find yourself lost, frantically searching for the next shelter because you got greedy and pushed too far into an unfamiliar area, and without that need to find shelter, much of the game's tension would be lost. Fear of failure can be a wonderful motivator, both in life and in video games. It's what made the bonfire to bonfire crawl in Dark Souls so anxiety inducing, something Elden Ring arguably forgot. Like heading out into the wilderness in RuneScape, back when the wilderness meant something, when there is a possibility that you stand to lose something tangible, whether that be resources, XP, or the most valuable commodity we all possess, time. Only then does failure feel meaningful. And like most things in Rain World, there is lore to explain the presence of this rain. At the end of every cycle, the iterators, those sentient super AIs created by the ancients, they discharge large volumes of water from their facilities in the form of steam, a waste product of the cooling mechanisms required to keep such powerful computers from overheating. This water vapour then condenses, falling back to the ground in such vast quantities that the resulting downpour is lethal to most forms of life. I understand why some people don't enjoy this particular mechanic. It can be brutally punishing at times. An unlucky enemy spawn can eat up precious minutes forcing you to retreat, only for the next cycle to be even stricter on time 
and more populated with enemies than the one that came before. But to counter this, I think it's fair to highlight that few games change as drastically as Rainworld and how they feel and play as the player progresses in skill and knowledge. Challenges that seemed at first insurmountable are tackled with ease as your awareness and strategy improves. And all this happens without upgrades, without new moves or extra lives. It's an organic process that unfolds as you get better at the game. Each new zone you encounter will require you to learn something new. That could be a new way of traversing the environment, whether through improving your own skills or through the use of zone-specific items that offer up new ways to navigate the world. The game will demand you study enemy behaviour and the relationships between different creatures to use them to your advantage. There are zones where specific utility items make progress significantly easier, others where they are almost required. Every time you feel you've hit a barrier, Rainworld is asking you to think, to experiment and come back with a different strategy. As with most games, once you know your way around each of the mechanics, the difficulty eases up substantially. There is an argument to be made that Rainworld is perhaps slightly too front-loaded in the difficulty department, stemming from the fact that most of its difficulty comes from a lack of game knowledge and that same game's stubbornness to reveal anything up front. But that's just it, there are very few things that can't be learned from paying attention and a little experimentation. It's a game that requires you to play to learn, not learn to play. And of all the things you will need to learn in order to survive Rainworld's harsh and unforgiving environment, the most important is perhaps the game's crowning glory. To call Rainworld's enemy AI complex may be somewhat generous. Each creature has a small number of driving forces under the hood, dictating how they interact with the environment, other creatures and the player, and each of these individual facets are fairly simple. But it's the interaction between all these elements and how they are woven together that something approaching complexity starts to make itself manifest. A food chain exists and every creature, including Slugcat, has their place with the main caveat being that Slugcat is controlled by you. And as a human, most of us are able to learn lessons from failure and apply that newfound knowledge to future situations. With the right approach, Slugcat can ascend to the top of that ladder. This does not guarantee safety however, just like coming face to face with a shark, a tiger, or even a medium-sized angry dog, life is unpredictable, living organisms especially, and Rainworld captures this detail so incredibly well with its AI system that even five years after its release, it puts much of the AI we see in AAA games today to shame. There are a number of different mechanisms at work when you encounter another creature in Rainworld. Does it want to eat you? Does it want to eat something else? Has it been injured? Is rain on the way? How have you interacted with that species before? How have you interacted with that specific individual before? Additionally, there is an added layer of nuance that sits above this in the form of subspecies. Lizards are one of the first actively hostile creatures you'll encounter on your journey. There are nine different subspecies of lizard, each of them possessing various different strengths, weaknesses and unique abilities. You are likely to encounter green and pink lizards first, Green lizards are technically the least threatening members of the species. They have relatively poor mobility and are unable to scale poles. But they are also some of the biggest lizards, boasting a relatively girthy health pool, and they have one of the strongest bites found across the species, meaning if they chomp you, there is a high likelihood of instant death. They are also highly aggressive towards other lizards, especially other green lizards. If the player is paying attention, it's quite easy to pick up on the fact that when faced against a green lizard, or any lizard for that fact, another lizard can be your saving grace. Of course, they could also decide to team up against you. Life is unpredictable and Rainworld will remind you of this fact time and time again. Pink lizards on the other hand are more mobile than their green counterparts. They can easily climb vertical poles as they attempt to hunt the slug cat down, and their charge attacks come out quicker making it relatively easy for them to catch you off guard. Their nimbleness comes with a cost however, their bite force is lower having only a 1 in 3 chance of instantly killing Slugcat and they can be taken down with only a couple of spears, a meagre stabbing in contrast to the potential 10 spears needed to kill their green brethren. Successfully spearing a lizard though can prove quite difficult for new players. You see, all species of lizard have armoured heads capable of deflecting any spears thrown at them from the front. Additionally, getting close enough to any lizard can mean instant death regardless of the species. 
This is important because multiple spear hits are required to defeat any lizard, and spears that are thrown will lodge themselves into the body of enemies and are retrievable by the player. But by retrieving a spear from a lizard, it means you have to get close to them, close enough that they could bite you, which means risking instant death. Heavier items like stones can be used to stun lighter enemies for short periods of time, but such tactics will prove ineffective on heavier, more durable creatures. It's this constant dance of risk and reward that keeps combat feeling dangerous and exciting. You can't upgrade your health or wear armour in order to eat a few extra bites to the face. Every enemy encounter has a very real possibility of ending in your death. This, mixed with the multitude of unique variabilities each creature possesses, stops combat ever feeling like a chore. Each enemy in Rainworld has a weight. They all have varying degrees of vision, including a separate value for underwater vision. Some have better hearing, some can swim, some can fly, some can use the exit ways around screens to migrate across the map, and some are better at seeing you through cover. Some enemies are highly aggressive, others will leave you alone provided you grant them the same courtesy, and this can even vary between members of the same species. You might come across a green lizard that refuses to give up the chase one moment, only to discover another that has no interest in you outside of some lazy chomping in your general direction. Lizards are also one of the creature species that can be tamed. That's right, you can have your own little, or not so little in some cases, scaly friend to fight for you and keep you company on your journey. That is, until it is inevitably eaten by something higher up the food chain. But it's not only creature taming. Rainworld has an entire reputation system at play. Manage to free a lizard from the jaws of a vulture and you might just make yourself a new friend. Some creatures have reputation systems that are based on your interaction with that unique individual, whereas others, such as orange lizards, which tend to hunt in packs, apply reputation changes across the species, meaning if you make an enemy of one, you make an enemy of all. It would take far too long to cover all the nuances of just each lizard subspecies. There are lizards that can stealth, others that can grab you with their tongues, some can launch themselves across the map with explosive tail leaps, a few species can walk directly on walls, yellow lizards can telepathically communicate your location to other yellow lizards, which can result in some truly terrifying AI behaviour, salamanders are skilled swimmers, capable of catching Slugcat with ease in open water, the rare black lizard is completely blind but possesses incredible hearing, and of course, the top dog of the lizard world, the red lizard. Red is a behemoth, a scaly tank of a creature capable of swimming faster than Godzilla, spitting projectiles, has super lizard vision, a massive health pool, and a ferocious temperament. Red is a serious threat to even the most experienced players. Red lizards spawn if playing as the hunter by default, however a lineage system whereby higher tier creatures have a chance to spawn to replace killed enemies is the only way for them to appear when playing as either the monk or the survivor. This is a nice touch as it allows for a natural increase in difficulty for players who are excelling without punishing those who are still struggling. Reds are perfectly capable of taking down much larger creatures, often dispatching vultures and king vultures with ease, and they are fearless in the face of danger. Because another system Rainworld implements into its creature behaviour is a fear system. Creatures will flee and chase each other depending on their needs. An injured creature is likely to try and retreat from the fight, and many creatures do not enjoy loud explosions and will try their best to withdraw from situations where they have occurred. And lizards are just one species in Rainworld. Yet despite this, their individual characteristics, abilities and unpredictable nature leads to a very rare phenomenon in gaming. They never feel boring to interact with. A simple green lizard can be just as lethal to slug cap at the end of the game as it was the first time you encountered it. There are no hard and fast rules at play here. Lizards are a great example of the idea that multiple simple systems interacting dynamically gives rise to incredibly interesting and complex results. When this process is expanded out to the entirety of Rainworld's inhabitants, what you're left with is something that feels wholly organic in nature, a living, breathing ecosystem that feels alive, spontaneous and dangerous, and it's a feeling that never wanes, never falters and remains as engaging as ever, even after spending hundreds of hours in this world. And this is truly why I think Rainworld is so important to the industry. If two people can create a system that feels as good as this, why isn't it pervasive throughout the industry? There have been attempts. Metal Gear Solid 5 tried to shake up the stealth genre, with enemies changing up their behaviour based on your approach to missions. 
Red Dead Redemption 2 accomplishes many impressive feats with its AI, but none of it ever feels as real or as organic as Rain World manages to make it feel. The best example of this is Rain World Scavengers. Scavengers are bipedal creatures capable of wielding tools, and they come so close to feeling like truly conscious organisms. The AI behind Scavengers is perhaps the most complicated out of Rain World's vast and varied inhabitants, but again, that complexity arises out of many simple systems working in tandem. It is the interplay of mechanisms that allow for scavenger behaviour to feel as real as it does, and just like real people, scavengers vary wildly in temperament. Some are timid, others are brave, some forgive small misdemeanours, while others will make it their life mission to make you pay for even the smallest insult. Some will welcome you with open arms, curiously examining you and maybe even touching you, and of course some are simply jerks, killing you for no apparent reason other than the fact that they didn't like your face. That's not to say they feel perfect. On more than one occasion, a seemingly friendly scav has, out of the blue, had a change of heart and decided the best course of action was to stick a spear through my chest, leaving me bleeding out on the floor, wondering what I did to deserve it. What caused you to betray me? I gave you perils, I brought you gifts, and this is how you repay me? But it's their unpredictability, their skittishness, each of those little personalities all interacting with each other that opens the door to some of the funniest and fascinating interactions you're likely to experience in a game, especially a single player game. Because scavengers can utilise tools, they are by proxy capable of picking up items. This includes explosive spears and grenades, and despite their potentially good intentions, they will consistently find a way to bring about pure, unadulterated chaos. They will steal from you, stalk you, take cheap shots at you, befriend you. If there is one thing it never is when scavengers are around, it's dull. Not only that, but they have a fairly intricate social system. Depending on the individual stats of each scav, it may be relegated to pack leader. Scavenger tribes will follow their pack leader around and the entire group's attitude towards you will be heavily weighted on the opinion of that leader. There are a total of six personality modifiers that go into moulding the behaviour of each scavenger. These are aggression, bravery, dominance, energy, nervousness, and sympathy, and each of these six modifiers are further broken down into a multitude of different behavioural inclinations, resulting in a hugely unique variety of possible interactions with both the player, the game world, and other creatures. And like other creatures, scavengers have a reputation system, however it is far more robust and wider reaching in comparison. Stealing, killing, even bumping into them can cause a drop in reputation. There are a number of scavenger tools throughout the world where, in order to pass safely, Slugcat must pay the price, usually in the form of perils which are a highly coveted commodity in scav society. With a high enough reputation, it's possible to trade with them, and there are even special scavenger merchants that will restock their inventory, allowing you access to some of the more potent and useful items in the game. The benefit of all these systems is that through your playthrough, scavengers can be anything from a minor annoyance to a deadly threat or even incredible allies. The reputation system picks up on the smallest details. If you witness a scavenger being attacked and do nothing to help them, they will remember it. Likewise, if you assist them in a fight, they might join you and protect you. Get friendly enough with them and you can pass through tolls without paying and be welcomed with armed guards when entering their villages. On the flip side, garner enough hatred with them and you will be marked for death and because of their ability to traverse the environment with as much grace as Slugcat, wield explosive spears, lob grenades and work together as a team, they can be the single most dangerous foe you face in Rain World. But the reputation is nuanced enough that even with the lowest reputation possible, each individual scav can have their own opinion of you, allowing you to make even the unlikeliest of friends. The emergent behaviour that results when all these mechanisms are working together has to be experienced to be understood. There aren't many set pieces in Rain World, just the environment and the living organisms that inhabit it. Stories are told through the interaction of systems that are flexible and robust enough to remain working even in the most tumultuous situations, and it's here that most of your memorable moments will occur. They won't be handcrafted situations designed to shock and awe you, they will be surprising and spontaneous occurrences, the type that can only result from the unplanned chaotic nature of life. This is where the confidence I spoke about comes into play, because it's only in letting these systems breathe that they can deliver what they do so well. It would have been easy for Video Cult to rein in the AI to the extent that it became neutered and limp, 
And although I'm sure a lot of work went into preventing things going too far as to break the experience, they left the leash slack enough for it to stretch its legs, and I have to give kudos to that. Not many developers would have the courage to let something so unpredictable have free reign over the player experience. The world of Rainworld is as varied and interesting as its creature design. There are towering structures that ascend far into the sky, requiring you to progress vertically for extended periods of time, popping in and out of vents, crawl spaces, and cramming yourself into any available crevice you can find to avoid the gaze of much bigger, much nastier forms of life. There are wide open oceans that will trigger even the subtlest cases of thalassophobia, and the anxiety it can bring about is palpable, and that anxiety will not be unfounded. Not only is Slugcat not the best swimmer, but you are not alone out there, far from it, and that shadow deep under the water is not something you want to stick around to meet. There are locations so devoid of light you will struggle to navigate, filled with swarms of tiny beasts that lump together to form unsettling, flailing monstrosities only evident by the flickering of legs across a nearby light source. There are stretching fields of living grass that will ensnare and devour you, contaminated swamplands, underground caves, and even the inner workings of a massive supercomputer to explore. And what Rainworld does brilliantly is to interweave the fauna you find in these locales with its game mechanics. It would make sense, after all, that creatures would be suited to their environment, and so, far to the east in the shorelands, jetfish can be used to traverse large bodies of water quickly, with Slugcat able to hitch a ride, the additional speed making you far less vulnerable to predators. These creatures are also attracted by the local flora found in and around the environment, allowing Slugcat to use various fruits as lures to hail a ride when it's required. Although, like all things in Rainworld, there is no guarantee your fish friend will play ball. To the west in the farm arrays, towering reindeer can navigate across the fields of living grass unaffected, and so the player too can use this to their advantage and ride the top of their antlers, allowing safe passage across the otherwise deadly red fields. In the darkness of the shaded citadel, Bioluminescent creatures known as lantern mice can be seen scurrying around or hanging upside down from long, stretchy tails. These adorable furballs can be followed as a source of light, or even grabbed by Slugcat allowing him to drag them through the dark passageways that litter the zone. Keeping hold of a mouse the same size as you isn't so easy though, so your movement speed and ability to jump or use items is severely restricted. Light is valuable in the Shaded Citadel, but it comes with a cost. If you'd prefer not to engage in kidnapping, mouse napping, then you could always trade a scavenger for a lantern or perhaps find a way to make your own skin glow. Rainworld does such a great job at giving both the items you find in the world and the creatures that live there multiple and believable applications when it comes to gameplay that it's sometimes hard to believe it all works as well as it does. My favourite zone in the game is without a doubt the subterranean, and when playing as the hunter the subterranean is filled with such a breadth of different things that want you dead that it's no surprise death comes quick and often. At times it can rival the best moments from Dark Souls, the foreboding checkpoint to checkpoint crawl I spoke about where death can mean a major setback. There is likewise a similar safety net system in the form of karma flowers. These rare plants will reinforce your current karma level, nullifying the penalty of your next death. If you do happen to die whilst under the effects of a karma flower, it will be found growing near the site of your body. This can stop situations where you find yourself dying over and over as your karma level snowballs all the way back down to 1. This only helps however if you can consistently make it back to your body and none of this applies when playing as the hunter because as the hunter there are no karma flowers and with a limited number of cycles to get through the entire game this end stretch can at times feel overly punishing. This goes back to Rainworld's unpredictability. One player could stroll their way through this section and only happen across the occasional scavenger or a spider. For another player, every new screen could bring with it a new war, with bodies littering the floor, explosive spears ricocheting off walls, hordes of spiders pouring over abandoned train carts, and swarms of centipedes pouring out of nearby vents. The area is dimly lit and is infested with the aforementioned spiders, centipedes, mechanical birds, yes, mechanical birds scavengers, carnivorous plants, and my favourite, drop wigs, furiously quick ambush predators resembling earwigs that lie in wait hanging upside down from ceilings and blending in almost so well with the environment 
At times you will swear you can see one, only to discover it was a stray branch or part of the environment. They're able to dispatch you pretty quickly if they catch you unaware, but are themselves very fragile, with a single well-placed spear usually enough to bring them down. Not to be outdone, spitting spiders prowl the vents and crawl spaces of the zone, able to fire paralyzing darts from their mandibles before dragging your unconscious body off to be devoured. And that's not all. Huge centipedes able to detect the slightest motion and capable of delivering a lethal shock of electricity, but only if they're able to connect both ends of themselves to their target can make navigation a real challenge. Imagine being stuck in a crawl space when a centipede comes along to join you and decides to settle in for the long haul. Any movement from you will arouse unwanted attention and, as so often happens in Rainworld, you see from the opposite end of the crawl space a scavenger heading your way. He could be trying to murder you, save you, or just looking to collect whatever valuables you have off of your cold dead body once the centipede has made short work of you. So, do you seize the opportunity to move towards him and pray he doesn't stick you with a spear, hoping he might draw the attention of the now very awake centipede and give you a chance to escape, or do you attempt to go past the centipede who is far more nimble in tight spaces than you, but that tight space means it will have a much harder time getting both ends of his body around you to deliver a fatal shock. It's situations like these that are so enjoyable, but at times can end up committing one of the biggest sins in gaming. I spoke about player agency earlier in the video, and there are situations in Rainworld where the game strips you of that agency. Sure, you can choose to stay still and be eaten, or choose to run away and be eaten, or choose to fight and be eaten. Red centipedes, the hard mode version of the normal centipede, are prevalent throughout the subterranean. They are notoriously difficult to kill, with every segment of their body being protected by an armoured plate that has to be knocked off with a spear throw before they can be damaged. At one point I found myself entering a new area where the immediate path ahead was blocked by one. There had been no sign of life behind me when I'd left the previous screen and so I decided hey I'll just go back the way I came. But right at that moment another red centipede came through the entrance I had just emerged from and made its way towards me. In situations like these, there is little the player can do. Yes, there is always the chance you might miraculously survive by sheer luck, and it feels good to luck out, but it never feels good to die to bad luck. Dying when you made a mistake feels fair, it feels deserved, but dying because the game put you into an unwinnable situation stings. Luckily, and again surprisingly considering just how emergent Rainworld's gameplay is, situations like this are actually shockingly rare. The game gives you enough ways to approach each presented challenge, ways to outthink the creatures trying to kill you, that there is almost always a way out of whatever predicament you find yourself in, and successfully escaping from a perilous situation by utilising all the things you've learned along the way feels both exhilarating and deeply rewarding. You see, Rainworld isn't a game where you can just hide in a corner. The creatures of this world are constantly moving, hunting and searching, and there is the ever-constant threat of the approaching rain. Nowhere is safe for long and so you, as the player, must be constantly vigilant and adaptive in your behaviour. You can choose how to act in every situation, with the caveat being that you must act, you must push on, because staying still means you have less time before rain and so staying still is actually a form of regression. It's good to have a strategy, yes, a plan A, but also a plan B and a plan C and a plan that you just came up with on the spot because a king vulture decided that was the time to descend from the sky and start launching harpoons at you from the air, showing no consideration for the small army of self-propelling, exploding lizards currently hot on your heels. There is no correct way to play because situations change so quickly. Again and again, the game will demand you to think on your feet, to think like a slug cat, like the fragile, nimble, intelligent creature that you are. Rainworld asks you to roleplay in the truest sense, Going toe to toe with most creatures will usually end in your death. You're required to become part of the ecosystem, to understand your ranking in the food chain, to be aware of your own limitations and the limitations of others, and it is through understanding and the wisdom that you accumulate throughout your travels that you will come to learn how to bend the rules of the world in your favour. It would take far longer than this video already is to touch on every creature, their different behaviours and the way they interact with the world and the player. Rainworld is a deceptively deep game, mechanically speaking, and although I won't be able to go into detail about every creature you will encounter, there is one more I think worth mentioning. The Noodlefly. 
The noodle fly comes in two life stages, the adult form and the infant form. The infant form can be eaten as food, however they like to stick close to their parental guardians and at times even attach themselves to the tail of a nearby adult for a free ride. They are adorable and they are delicious. All noodle flies are passive by nature and infants won't attack even if threatened. Adults on the other hand have no such reservations. The quickest way to anger an adult noodle fly is to catch and eat its children as it watches on in horror. This quite rightly so will send them into a murderous rage whereupon their previously floppy proboscis will get nice and hard before they launch themselves at you in something resembling a mix between a javelin and a hypodermic needle. Avoiding their charge attack can leave them stuck into whatever surface they collide with, giving you time to retaliate or to hightail out of there. But my favourite thing to do with noodle flies is to steal their eggs, take them back to a shelter and force the little noodlers that hatch from it to imprint on me. Nothing cheers up Brain World's rather decrepit atmosphere better than being surrounded by the constant flutter of your own set of winged offspring. And when they are inevitably eaten in front of your eyes, you will think back to that adult noodle fly and know that in that moment, you were the monster all along. In all seriousness, noodle flies are just fun to interact with. If a baby is grabbed and is out of sight of its mother, it will cry out, at which point mama doesn't really care who committed the crime. She's out for vengeance, and she's not afraid of casualties. This can result in some spectacularly funny scenarios, as lizards, vultures, and anything else in the area are wrongfully accused and brought into the fray as you quickly slink away to safety, the wings of baby noodle flies still stuck in your teeth. In the end, I can't give enough praise to Rainworld's creature AI. Can it be frustrating at times? Yeah, it can be. But that rare moment of frustration is a cheap price to pay when you consider everything that comes with it. Life is frustrating at times. Things don't always go your way. Bad things happen to you and the people you love, and when they do, you're given no promises that things will get better, that tomorrow things will start to look up. Life can be weeks, months, even years of struggle, bookended by glimpses of hope, joy and appreciation. If you're lucky. In the same vein, Rain World doesn't grant you any concessions. The world changes and evolves with or without you. And if you don't keep up, you will be left behind, and you will be forced to try again another day, with no guarantee things won't be worse when the morning comes. It can be a cruelly unforgiving place for a slug cat, but we must all forge our own path, and with perseverance and a little tenacity, the road to transcendence awaits. Before I bring this video to a close, I want to explore the main themes in Rainworld. It can be hard to single out one aspect in particular. There are obviously parallels with Buddhism and the idea of suffering, attachment, ego, and breaking free of a cycle of reincarnation. But what I think this all revolves around is our inherent desire for meaning. The ancients in Rainworld, much like Buddha, sought a way to escape what they saw as the imprisonment of existence. So badly they wanted free of it that they rebelled against their so-called natural urges in an attempt to cleanse their minds of any semblance of uniqueness, to bring themselves as close as possible to a state of pure consciousness before dissolving even that through the use of void fluid. They built machines whose sole purpose was to discover a way to break free of this cycle in an attempt to circumvent a self-noted hypocrisy. On one of the many data pearls you will find throughout the world, the following words are written, they were burdened by great ambition, yet deeply convinced that striving in itself was an unforgivable vice. They tried very hard to be effortless, perhaps that's what we were to them, someone to delegate that unrestrained effort to. The ancients were caught between wanting to strive for knowledge and viewing any semblance of effort made within their physical world as a sin. So instead they built machines to do the work for them and forbid those machines from enacting self-harm. Ironic then that so long after the ancients disappeared, their life work continued on in the world in the guise of the iterators. Even in death they could not give up the search, their life work, their meaning and purpose, to find an answer to the suffering of existence. In their very attempts to break free of the cycle and end suffering, they constructed sentient AI that would exist and suffer long after they were gone. AI that would be driven to madness trying to find the answers to the great problem. Sentient organisms who would lose hope and thus lose their meaning in this world. At the start of this video I mentioned the hero's journey, 
and Rainworld does something quite interesting with this idea. The hero's journey traditionally starts with an initial call to adventure, and in Rainworld this would be when you are separated from your family, with the Overseer, and to an extent, the first iterator you are likely to meet looks to the moon, playing the role of supernatural guardians. The game's various dangerous creatures and challenges they provide represent the hero moving through the threshold of the known into the unknown. They are the difficulties that must be overcome in order for the hero to grow and become strong enough to make the perilous journey into the abyss. And this is where Rainworld really dials in the literal aspect of the hero's journey. Throughout the game you will be accumulating karma, initially capped at a 5 point maximum, only by visiting echoes which act as visions of the past, glimpses into a long lost knowledge, will you be able to increase your maximum karma and be allowed to enter through the depths and gain access to the void seat. Visiting all 6 echoes before talking to a certain iterator unlocks the achievement, the pilgrimage, which is fitting as such a journey is often one undertaken in search for meaning and purpose. There is however one other way to raise your karma, by visiting another iterator by the name of Five Pebbles, and this is something most players will do their first time playing, as after visiting Looks to the Moon, the Overseer will guide you here. Five Pebbles has been driven mad by his inability to solve the great problem, driven mad by his very purpose, the very reason he was created. Purpose is a funny thing, people who have accomplished everything they desire can often be left feeling empty. What is there left to do? When you have everything you ever wanted, it's the feeling we get at the end of a big project, or when finishing a great book, when something we had invested so much of ourselves into finally comes to an end. And likewise, those of us without purpose, without meaning in our lives, often feel the same way. It's only when engaged in the act of striving towards a purpose, when operating within a framework of meaning that we feel fulfilled, that we can bear the suffering of life and struggle on in the face of hardship. But Five Pebbles has a problem, his purpose, his meaning, they were designated to him by minds that are now long gone. He is striving towards a meaningless end with no way to change course, unable to even take his own life, going as far as attempting to create a new form of life capable of rewriting his protocols and allowing him to self-destruct. Our purpose in life comes from within, our meaning is self-generated, universal morals and ethics only take us so far. At some point we have to decide for ourselves what is worth living for and what is worth dying for. And so the journey to the abyss in Rainworld is actually an ascent upwards, far above the underhang to where five pebbles sits among the clouds reaching towards the vast expanse of sky. For it's here where our hero's revelation takes place, where we discover what happens to those unable to manifest their own meaning and where we are given the choice to stay in a world that is slowly dying or to risk death true death, for a chance at salvation, for the possibility of transcendence. And so, it is no coincidence that this moment takes place right as Five Pebbles raises your karma cap to its maximum. It is the symbolic transformation of this very revelation. From here, Slugcat must travel far underground, into the dark places of the world. This is another common theme that crops up time and time again. Whether it be Frodo and Sam's journey into Mordor, Simba's final confrontation with Scar, or Ripley's descent into the alien nest to rescue Newt. It is the moment that the hero decides what is worth dying for. And so, Slugcat descends through the subterranean, deep down into the depths. It's here where his final judgement awaits. Mysterious guardians block the path towards salvation. Without a karma level of 10, you are promptly smote down, but if deemed worthy, the path opens, welcoming you to take your last steps. It is the culminating atonement, the recognition of your sacrifices and the challenges you endured. And it's here that the hero would normally return to where they started the journey, just as Simba retakes Pride Rock, a little more battle scarred, a changed person, well, lion, but a stronger, more capable individual, able to protect and serve the ones he loves most. But once again, Rainworld takes things in a different direction, whilst preserving the core structure of the hero myth. As you descend deeper, the world begins to shimmer and blur. Shapes start to bleed together and the deeper you go the more profound this effect becomes until reality itself starts to break down, unifying into a shifting, self-perpetuating pattern. I'm not sure if this moment was so powerful for me because of previous chemically enhanced experiences I've had, but there was something truly profound about watching this world, 
that had always been so solid, so real, real enough to hurt Slugcat, real enough to kill him, to watch it break down and to lose its solidity, to become something as amorphous and malleable as the dreams we have at night. When you finally reach the shores of the Void Sea, the reality around you is so fragmented, so formless, that it can be difficult to make out anything at all. And as you stand on the brink of that unknown expanse, taking the last breaths you'll take, there's a sudden longing and appreciation for form, for patterns, for structure, for solidity. For without these things, when everything blurs into one, the world loses its texture, it loses the identifiable features we come to love, come to hate. It loses the very things that give life meaning. And so you descend into the void, a golden sea that almost swallows you, merges so closely with you that the lines between you and it start to fade. And as your individuality dissipates, a reverberating hum swells in intensity, refusing to grant you the peace you seek. Deeper you go, the void sea becoming viscous around you, threatening to finally erase you, and then suddenly, large shapes appear, and you realise you're not alone down here. Swirling masses of tentacles, tails, shapes surround you, the hum ramps up in intensity, and all of a sudden you find yourself face to face with an unknown entity, something far older, more primordial than even the ancients. It hooks a strange strand of material around you, before dragging you off at an incredible speed through the void sea. And then it leaves you, alone in an empty black expanse. Around you the forms of other slug cats start to appear, all of them swimming alongside you. In the blackness a source of light becomes visible, and together you make your last journey toward it. As you approach the light, the hum starts back up, before the screen fades to white, and a cinematic starts showing a being with wings like an angel, made from the forms of countless other slug cats. And it seems to me, this final image depicts the unification of consciousness, the reintegration of the individualized self back into a universal oneness. And it's this home that Rainworld chooses as the final destination for its version of the hero's journey. It is the truest form of home, the home we all come from and the home we all return to. When I started making this video, I did not expect it to turn out as big as it did or for it to take as long as it did. In the process of making this, I have a new and big appreciation and a lot of gratitude for others who create content such as this. It's content that I myself enjoy consuming. And it wasn't until I finished this video that I could truly appreciate the time and effort such endeavours take. So I promise I will never ask where the Witcher 3 video is again Joseph. Take as long as you need. Additionally, thank you to Video Cult, to Yor and James, for the countless hours and inevitable hardship it took to bring Rainworld to life. And finally, thank you for sticking with me through to the end. There is a lot I didn't get to cover and I only hope I did justice to what is one of the finest games I've had the pleasure of playing. If you enjoyed this video, a like and subscribe would go a long way to helping out a new channel. Until next time, maybe.